really excited to basically one dive in on the NFTs themselves and what you know inspired you to be interested in them, and then we can always share our interest from our side, and then really dive in on the wines themselves, um, the vineyards, the vintages, all of that information. So first off, thanks and and welcome, Palmer. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, appreciate it. Excited. So yeah, so we came and visited you. Oh, it was back in August now, September, and you actually um instigated the um kind of conversation a little bit about the nfts what what kind of brought you to being interested in nfts in the first place and um you know kind of wanting to work with them with your wines yeah i mean to be honest it's something that i still know very little about but i'm very very curious about i thought this would be a, a great way to learn um the the reason that i was kind of interested in and raised the the idea with you is because uh, you know i'm uh, friends with a guy named Gary Vaynerchuk, who's very involved in the in the NFT space, and and you know he's kind of constantly promoting the idea, and you know he's an old friend of mine, and is one of the people responsible for kind of inspiring me to pursue my my passion for wine, and that kind of led me on the path to uh, to making these wines and having this winery. So um, I, I tend to uh, I tend to pay attention when when Gary speaks, when Gary is, is passionate about something. So that that is kind of what what led me to to want to uh, do something in this uh, in this NFT world. That makes a lot of sense. And then in true Gary V kind of style, like these NFTs are certainly a a start. And to your point, it's a good learning point, but it's it's only skimming the surface of what NFTs can do. And it's kind of like his his V friends that themselves don't have a ton of that functionality built in, but using it as a a mechanism to kind of further the the technology and awareness so that's yeah exciting. Exactly. yeah no, well we're excited to be a part um you know from the vent side we, we're always looking to you know like you test new new frontiers push technology in the wine space our macro goal is to really bring the wine space into the 21st century and right now whether it be these, these smaller tests with just a few at the beginning um there's there's no telling on how these things can grow and evolve and um, we're excited to be a part as well. So um, I think that the next best part here, let's go through and just talk about the wines. And as as our the decanter article where you were featured and actually mentioned, um, this is the first, at least to all of our knowledge, the first Sonoma-based winery launching an NFT of any sorts. So why don't we start talking about the um, Ellis Alden wine that's featured in this in the NFTs? Um, and just to, for everybody's clarification, there are three NFTs listed. They're currently live on auction. Um, this, today's the, the second, the 22nd of uh, February, 2022. So 2222, kind of a um, fortuitous day, I guess. Um, and we have three NFTs listed right now. Um, and just to recap which ones they are, there's the 2013 Judge Palmer um, Ellis Alden Vineyard. There's a 2011 Judge Palmer George III Vineyard. And then the 2015 Judge Palmer Tokelon Vineyard. So could you share a little bit more about the Ellis Alden? Sure. Yeah. So um, the, the Alden family um, are, uh, are friends of mine. A, a very close friend of mine um, was, uh, was dating Jenny Alden a long time ago before I was even in the wine business. Uh, I was invited to their family's uh, vineyard ranch uh, up above Geyserville in the Alexander Valley back in, back in 2008. Um, I met my wife that weekend, so so the vineyard uh, is really special to me for that reason, not just because it makes really killer wine. Um, but when Michael and I started the Judge Palmer project, um, and we we started with the the Beckstoffer George's Third uh, Napa cabs, and we wanted to add some um, some Sonoma County vineyards to our lineup that we felt were kind of um, you know capable of of producing the same same high quality. Um, special cabernet that the best vineyards in napa do and um and i i suggested to michael that we we go up and, and take a look at my friend's uh vineyard ranch in alexander valley and you know at the time michael's is really uh in our partnership he's he's much more the the winemaker and the uh, vineyard guy and i'm much more the business guy so uh you know i've learned a lot doing this for the last 11 years but but back in uh back in 2012 2013 um, I, I think Michael kind of took my, my vineyard recommendations with, with a grain of salt, um, but I convinced him to go up there and see the property, and he was just completely blown away. Um, you drive on, on a dirt road 
um, 20 minutes up, up the mountain from Geyserville. Uh, the gates to the property are at about 1,400 feet. Um, and the first time we, we got there and talked to the vineyard manager, um, it was early in the morning and the fog was kind of, you know, rolling up the hill and we, we get to the property and we're up above the fog line and, and the vineyard manager said, yeah, you know, the fog knows, knows to do that. It knows to stop at our gates. Uh, and so, um, and then once you get to the gate, then it's kind of this giant uh, caldera. It has this really uh, dense black volcanic rock, this serpentine soil. Um, you know, the high elevations, obviously you're getting uh, the cooler nights to kind of retain the balance and the acidity in the grapes, but you're getting a, a ton of sunlight up there. Um, it's a 4,000 acre ranch. And that first day we went up there to, um, to take a look at it. Uh, Jenny's father, Ellis, you know, took us on this crazy ATV tour around the entire ranch and basically said, you know, take your pick. What do you want? You guys are getting us buying, you know, a small amount of grapes here. We can, you know, we can get you whatever you want. And Michael, you know, points up there to the highest point on the property, this separate south facing um, uh, little block up on the steepest portion. And, and Ellis said, well, <laughs> okay, that's, you know, that's the one block on the property where a contract, 10 ton contract. And, and usually the block makes 12 to 13 tons. So you can have, um, you can have, you know, the, the other two to three tons. And so that's what this 2013 um, Ellis Alden uh, cab that we're doing the NFT uh, is is from and um, and it's and it's special not just because it you know Michael turned out to be right it made you know really killer wine it's you know it's got a ton of depth it's got great structure um, it's 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 you know it's a big bold wine but it's not over the top you know Michael doesn't believe the, the grape has has you know so much complexity to it that you know we we don't really crush it with a bunch of new oak so it, you know despite it being a big bold wine it's not it's not over oaked it's it's really well balanced. Um, and, and it's special, you know, for another reason is that, you know, the next few years that block, the yields were lower. It did not make the 10 tons. So we, this is actually, um, the only vintage we were able to make until 2018 when the, the other winery that had that contract on that block expired and we took over the whole block starting in 2018. So we're about to actually release, um, our, our 2018 single vineyard from Alden next month. It'll be the first vineyard designate that we released from from Alden for Cabernet since this 2013 that we uh, that we did the NFT for. Oh wow, that's that's really interesting. I've always seen I haven't been able to experience the vineyards in the morning that time those high ones, but it's really cool when you're looking down and you just see like a basically fog ocean. Um, yeah, below exactly. you. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, I realized we kind of hopped right into the Ellis Alden because that was something I was really curious about learning more myself. But um, could we take one step back and talk about the Judge Palmer name? Because we have we have Emmett Scorestone, which is obviously yours and Michael's last names. Um, but let's talk about how you guys got to the Judge Palmer uh, before diving into the Beckstoffer vineyards. Yeah, so, you know, Palmer obviously is my first name. It was my mother's maiden name, um, and her father was a judge. So, so the label is named after my, my grandfather, who, who was Judge Palmer in uh, the small town of Placerville up in the Sierra foothills. And then we have our, our other brand, which is called Domenica Amato, which was named after Michael's, uh, Michael's grandmother, who's from Sicily. So, um, you know, the, the wines that are kind of inspired by Michael's Italian heritage, we do under that Domenica Amato brand. And then the wines that are inspired, you know, more by my uh, Californian heritage go under, the, go under the Judge Palmer brand. So primarily Cabernet, although we do some other of the kind of more traditional um, Bordeaux varieties and, and things that are kind of more associated with California, like Chardonnay. That makes sense. So moving on to the Beckstoffer, I guess we'll go in chronological order and start with the George the Third. Um, what led you guys, you and Michael, to that vineyard and um, and Beckstoffer in general? Can you elaborate a little bit more on why why their fruit's so special, no matter which of their vineyards it comes from? Um, yeah, so Andy Beckstoffer is, is kind of, you know, the premier grape grower in Napa Valley. Um, he started buying up these, you know, historic heritage vineyard sites um, back in the 90s. Um, the first two that he purchased um, 
I, I believe were are now the the Georgia's third vineyard and the Tokalon vineyard, the two that we're uh, that we've made wine from that we're doing these NFTs for. So the, those the the history of those vineyards. They were originally part of BV uh, Bolia. They were Bolia Vineyard Number Three and Bolia Vineyard Number Four. Um, they are just about two miles apart on the valley floor in Napa Valley. Um, Georgia's third is. Um, is in Rutherford, kind of on the east side of the valley floor, north of north of Mum, south of Camus, in between Con Creek Road and and Silverado Trail, um, and then Tokalon is is um, off west of Highway 29 in Oakville, just south of Mondavi, across the street from the Oakville um, Grocery. Um, we got very lucky to get introduced to to the the Beckstoffers. Um, Michael um, did some some um, vineyard development uh, work with uh, with Fred Schrader, and uh, you know Fred was uh, until until this year one of uh, if not the biggest client um, of of Beckstoffer is probably the most most well known um, producer of of Beckstoffer Cabernet has received you know numerous hundred plus point scores uh, from from all the different press. Um, so when Michael got his first head wine making job um, at Adobe Road back in 2008, um, Fred introduced Michael and the owner of Adobe to the, to the Beckstoffers and Michael started making wine from, from the, the Beckstoffer George's Third Vineyard. And the first couple he did got very good scores from Wine Spectator and he was kind of on the, the approved winemaker list uh, uh, over at, at Beckstoffer Vineyards. Um, and so when Michael and I just started to make wine together in 2011, um, you know, I said, great, let's, let's do it. What are we making? He said, well, I, you know, I have access to, to, uh, Beckstock for fruit. I said, that's, I don't know if I can afford that, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but hell well, yeah, if we're doing this, let's, let's do it. Right. Um, and, um, you know, like I said, Beckstock runs quite a few of these historic, um, prestige vineyards in Napa. Um, George's third is probably the, the, the biggest, of them, it's 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 over 200 acres, so it's it's usually the one um, that is kind of you know if you first get approved to work with Beckstoffer, that's kind of where you that's kind of where you start because there's the most fruit available there. There's a long wait list to get into um, you know Las Piedras and Tokalon and Dr. Crane and some some of these other vineyards. Um, so we started out with with George's third uh, in 2011, and um, you know the vineyard is really I, I think very unique. Um, the wines always have this really intense, bright red fruit character. Uh, the tannins are just super silky smooth. Always, it's uh, it's a real crowd pleasing wine, um, and one that um, you know is kind of not that it doesn't have staying power in the cellar, but it it really is, um, I think, more enjoyable to drink than when young than most than most Napa Cavs. Um, 2011, however, was it was a pretty unique vintage. You know, we, um, you know, roll, rolling the dice with Mother Nature. The year that we um, started making wine together, 2011, turned out to be this vintage that the wine press um, decided very early on was a was a bad vintage in Napa Valley. Um, if you ask everybody now with hindsight, it's like everybody's favorite vintage. Now everyone's like clamoring, oh, do you have any 11s? But back then, you know, our distributors, when we first started out and they said, yeah, we'll, we'll skip that one. We'll just start with the 2012 before even tasting the wine. Um, but we had a lot of our wine club members that we started started finding at the time that, that it was, you know, by far their favorite vintage, still is their favorite vintage. Um, it, it um, you know, it was a cool, wet, kind of uh, more Bordeaux-like vintage for Napa Valley. So the, the wines didn't have that that typical kind of, you know, fruit intensity and soft, silky tannins um, right off the bat. But given a couple of years in the cellar, the wine the wine really came around and uh, is, uh, I, I think, still the, the the best one that we made from uh, from George's third. Wow, yeah. No, I've, I've had a couple 2011s, not yours, um, and it is really interesting. It is there. There definitely is maybe a little bit more brightness, I guess, in terms of like in terms of acid. But that development that you can get, um, and to your point, the kind of the the more structure, the not I don't want to say I'm harsher, but the more developed tannins needed a little bit more time to kind of mellow. But once yeah. they get there, it's a, there is that depth of complexity as well as you know, still like a, kind of smooth on the palate. So yeah, um, and, you know, and there there is a there is kind of a wider range of of 
quality and style with 2011 than other vintages in Napa because you know we didn't have the kind of normal you know Indian summer that like you know six week period of you know kind of moderate you know warm uh dry you know dry weather we had you know rain that came in October and um because it had been cool leading up to that a lot of people were worried that the grapes you know weren't weren't ripe enough to pick. So some people picked because they were scared of the rain and they picked early. And those wines had a lot of, had a lot of like underripe kind of pyrazine green characters. Again, something that can be, you know, really enjoyable, especially with time and bottle, but it's not, you know, what people expect from, from Napa Cabernet. Um, we decided to, to wait, to wait it out. Um, picked after, picked after the rains, just kind of let it dry out and let it hang forever. Picked it on Halloween. Oh, wow. That's, that's quite late for, yeah. especially these, I mean, that was 10 years ago, but still, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. We had, so, I mean, for, for our listeners too, the reason you guys let it hang is because right after it rains, the, the grapes kind of swell a little bit with the extra water, right? And then you lose some concentration. So you got to not only let it dry out, but then the rain passes and then you got to let it sit for a little while to kind of get back to that. Exactly. Yeah. Rain. And there's also the risk of, risk of disease, but this, this particular old vine block, um, there had this kind of you know quadrilateral um, um, trellising system, a lot of lot of airflow and, and a lot of kind of protection from from the rains as well. The way the canopy was set up, so you know even though at the time you know we were the low man on the totem pole there at, at George's Third, so this you know the B1A block wasn't at the time thought of as as like the best block in the vineyard, but um, it, it turned out to be the perfect block for those particular. Uh, weather conditions that, that that season so oh nice yeah no I've I've seen that trellising before the name's escaping me I think it's like some guy's name um that, that's really cool I love those when the old vines are trellised that way um well that's that's awesome I, I the George's third that makes that makes some sense that it is a little larger but if you get those special blocks especially in the right vintage it's always great um yeah and most people there's kind of a there's the old sort of dry you know, creek bed running through the middle of the vineyard and the stuff on the, um, on the west side of that, of that, you know, what basically looks like a, di a ditch, um, the stuff that's right next door to Camus, that's the F block. Um, that's where most people who do vineyard des designates from George's third, that, that tends to be the block that they come from. Um, and so the other side of the hill, there aren't as many um, the other side of the creek aren't as many, and that's where we were over in the B1A. But there are some really, really terrific um, spots there um, as it kind of rolls rolls up the hill a little bit towards Silverado Trails. There's some really great, great blocks there. Awesome. So then um, moving on from that, we'll go to the next Beck Stoffer, and it's probably the most famous Beck Stoffer. Do you want to talk about that, that 2015 Tokelon? Um, sure. Yeah, so we did we did four years um making wine from george's third the whole time you know begging 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 to to get into tokelon and we finally got got the uh the phone call in 2015 that they had you know set aside like two rows for us in tokelon we're, we're by far the smallest producer um in that vineyard but uh we we jumped at the chance not not just because it um you know the name is kind of you know so historic and iconic that it gives us a marketing advantage but but it also um it's the more age-worthy um, wine, more more complex um, wine, you know, no doubt about it. Than the George's Third, as much as I love, like like I said, that that telltale bright red fruit character. You know, if you're talking about buying something to put it in a cellar for 20 years, you know, Tokelon is Tokelon is it. You know, um, so yeah, the 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 name for those for those people who aren't familiar with it, um, there was a uh, kind of one of the first sort of um, you know, let's say famous California vineyards was, was, uh, Tokelon and was back, um, planted in the 1800s and up until prohibition, they produced quality wines from there. And then, you know, after prohibition, the property got split up, but, but a bunch of different pieces. And, um, most of what was the original Tokelon vineyard, uh, became, uh, Robert Mondavi in, in the sixties. Um, one, one piece of it obviously became, um, became Bolia Vineyard number four. And uh, when Andy bought BV number four, 
he decided, hey, this is, you know, this is part of, uh, of this history of this Tokalon vineyard. So I'm going to, I'm going to use that name. I'm going to call it Bexoffer Tokalon. And of course, there was a, a big lawsuit with, with Constellation, the owners of, of Mondavi. But, um, you know, Andy argued that this is, this is not a, uh, this is not a brand name that you own. This is a, this is a historic place of which of which you know I share a piece, um, and and that argument that argument won. So, um, or got the right to to use the Tokalon Vineyard name for him and his clients in perpetuity. Now there's a lot of kind of you know legal hoops that we have to jump through, you know disclaimers and and certain specific wording describing the vineyard that everybody has to use on their back label or else we get a cease and desist letter from constellation but um but it's worth it to jump through all the hoops because it really is uh really is a special vineyard it, you know it has it has you know a little bit of that kind of you know like that soft red berry fruit character that that you get from the oakville cabs but it it has this structure that that almost feels like a mountain like a mountain vineyard, it almost doesn't even make sense that something on the valley floor can have have that level of of um, you know not not only uh, complexity but but like just power power to it. You know? Yeah, yeah. The, the Togolon examples, and I, we actually were able to have. Um, I think it must have been one of these bottles, or it might have been a different vintage, but we had a, one of the Judge Palmers. Actually, it was the one that was in our our box, um, the Togolon. So I think that might have been the 2018. 17, I think. 17, yeah. yes. Um, and that was, it's interesting because like exactly what you're saying, it's that, it's that balance that everybody's looking for between like the acid, the structure and the fruit. It seems to have like just the perfect balance of all of them rather than, you know, needing winemaking to kind of bring it into in this way. Um, yeah, no, that's really exciting. For some people who don't know, I think um, a, a bulk of the Opus blend also comes from the Tokalon blocks um, from Mandavi. So it's, it's you know their prestige vineyard as well, so it's just it's really cool to have this historical piece. Um, yeah, and they've, they've long made like the Mandavi Reserve, you know, Tokalon Vineyard, and now they have a separate brand called the Tokalon Vineyard Company um, that um, Andy Erickson makes. So like you know you you name it like of the the who's who um, winemakers in in Napa Napa Valley, you know Andy, you know Thomas Brown. Um, all, they all, everyone works with Tokalon Vineyard because it's, you know, special. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, so in addition to the wine, um, so each NFT gives everybody a right to three signed bottles of each of these, these wines. Um, but we have a number of little, not little, a number of tasting components going on with it as well. So we have, we'll have a virtual tasting, which will be very similar to this. There's an in-person tasting um, and the winemaker dinner. Um, is that your, it looks like your vineyard behind you. Um, you guys, you want to talk a little bit about what may go on with the, the in-person tasting, what people will be able to kind of see and experience? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So this is um, my virtual background here. I'm in, I'm in my home office, not at the winery, but, uh, but yeah, this is uh, um, our spot here in, in Dry Creek Valley, kind of tucked up in this secluded um, glen up in the West Hills of Dry Creek, about, about a, um, a mile up off of West Dry Creek Road, a couple hundred feet above the valley floor. Uh, we make wine in this little uh, barn here. There's two barns and that's, that's where all the winemaking happens. And it's just uh, the two of us, it's just Michael and I, we don't have any employees, we don't have any investors. We don't have any consultants, um, so if you come come to the winery for a tasting, you're gonna you're gonna sit down with with one of us on this little patio that that overlooks the vineyard here. Um, we do grow some Cabernet here on the property. We we'll also grow uh, Grenache and uh, and Petite Syrah. And um, as we were talking about before, in addition to kind of the, the different Judge Palmer cabs from you know from Bexar for Tokalon from from Stagecoach. Uh, from the Alden Ranch, which is now known as uh, Star Springs. Um, we have our estate cab and a, a Sonoma County uh, Cabernet blend, and then, you know, a bunch of different reds under our Domenica label, Grenache blends, Barbera, a bunch of fun Italian whites. And uh, yeah, so a tasting experience at the winery, you know, you're just sitting here looking at these vines, sitting down with the two of us. And, um, and then as far as the, the dinner goes, you know, we kind of uh, have a really close friend in town who lives just up the street from the winery 
uh, named Matteo, who's kind of the chef's chef of of uh, of Healdsburg. He's not not the most famous name, but like you know, we you you walk into uh, a restaurant, including like I walked into Single Thread with Matteo, and you know the owner and the chef of Single Thread like comes out of the kitchen to greet Matteo and talk to him about food for ten minutes. Um, so what we thought that we could do, you know, a real uh, nice small intimate dinner, Michael and I, Matteo, um, the NFT holders you know, have, have Mateo cook something up really special, um, pair it with some of our library wines and, uh, and do a nice kind of, um, exclusive, uh, harvest celebration dinner with our, with our NFT holders. Oh, that sounds, sounds great. Can you, uh, on the note of the library, I guess, how many cases there's less than two cases of any of these wines left, right? The NFT wine. Yeah. Yeah. Both the, uh, yeah, the Alden um, and the and the fifteen Toklon, like we are we are down to like there's there's not even really a library of these wines left. It's just our it's just our personal like Michael and I keep one case of each, um, and that's that's what we're pulling from for these the three bottles that are going to the NFT holders for that. Um, the twenty eleven we were we were a little bit more. Um, uh, careful with with not with not selling. It was our first vintage. We wanted to have a little bit extra, so I think there's I think we have five cases of that left. But these are both like you know extremely all three of them extremely uh, <laughs> rare and limited. You know we made um, hundred and uh, hundred and thirteen cases of the of the Alden originally, and like I said, there's you know there's like fifteen bottles left. Um, the uh, 2015 Tokalon, we did about 175 cases, and there's, you know, again, 15 bottles left. Um, and then the, uh, we did 200 cases of the 2011 in Georgia, and there's, yeah, like five or six cases left. Yeah, that's awesome. And there's no other way to get those wines, really, other than you guys just personally. No, yeah, example. like I said, like once it's, once it's below two cases, like, it doesn't matter, you know, how much money you've spent with us and, you know, how long you've been a club member. Once it's into our personal collection, like we're not, we're not selling them. Um, and, and the same with that, with that 2011, it's, it's, it's not, uh, not in the, not in the purchasable library for wine club members anymore. So. Awesome. Well, that's, that's part of the beauty of it. And then something that we've, we've been touching on just circling back here and we'll, we'll round off here because we're right about it. 30 minutes is like, so one thing that you've you kind of thought about, and it'd be interesting to see where hear a little bit more about your potential vision for the NFTs, but is like the idea of having it be the label. Um, I was actually speaking with, um, I believe it was the reporter for Decanter, and it's interesting that some people keep bottles that they like. They'll they'll soak the bottles and take the label and put it in a scrapbook. But what what the NFT offers you the ability to do is not only you know you get the rights to these certain bottles and the experiences but you also are able to start building your own virtual wine kind of scrapbook or your own virtual seller that you could pull up anywhere and show your friends rather than having to lug this whole you know book around to show people or take them to your seller so I think I think that's a really interesting way to be able to kind of bring a piece of whether it's the experience afterward and be able to have like a talking point that you can show somebody to talk about or something that you know you can have before it's even redeemed I think that's just such a unique unique opportunity yeah, no, I think so too. Um, like I said to the to Canner reporter, I mean, you know, wine has kind of was kind of the original collectible. I mean, I think before baseball cards, you know, before before uh, anything else, people were people were collecting wine and you know, um, you know, showing off wine in their in their wine cellars. You know, half half of uh, probably for most people, more than half of the of the allure and having a wine cellar is to show off the bottles you have in there more so than to age them or drink them. You know, it's about showing them off. And so um, I think in the future, that's uh, uh, that's what that's what the nfts are gonna kind of um you know signify um especially as we're kind of increasingly living in sort of you know virtual worlds all the time um the metaverse and all that you can have a you know a virtual uh, a virtual wine cellar you know with your wine nfts in there to show off to people so yeah no, that's awesome and i i like and whether it be the label or some sort of uh, depiction down the line that still tells you what the wine is. I, I think that's great. Um, you know, there are a few other projects out there that have their NFTs are way more expensive. These are, you know, attainable. Um, you know, the, the bidding starts at 600 um, for the Alden. 
wines. So. Well, and pl yeah, plus these are, again, these are wine library wines that you can't, you know, you're not going to be able to buy anywhere else anyway. So, you know, it's not like, I, I think, you know, not to criticize other people's pro projects, but, you know, just because you, you know, you take a nice bottle of Cabernet and, you know, put it in a different, fancier bottle, like it doesn't make the, you know, it's still a current vintage of wine that you could, you know, pay a normal price for elsewhere. So, um, I think this, you know, the, I'm, I'm hoping anyway that what we're doing here is a little unique and, and also, you know, the, you know, you're talking about the value of it, not, not just that it's, you know, less expensive than a lot of these other products, but you're in, in sort of real world goods, you know, you're getting, you know, this is a, you know, this winemaker dinner is a $500 a person, you know, value. The wine is, is uh, certainly worth, you know, what we're charging plus the, the virtual tasting uh, and the, and the in-person tasting experiences. So you're talking about, you know, several thousand dollars worth of, worth of value in each one. Yeah. In, in then, the real world stuff, you know. Exactly. Yeah. And it's not, there's no markup. So, I mean, I've, I can attest to visiting the vineyard and visiting the winery. It's, it's, it's an amazing experience. It's such a, it's a beautiful location. Um, the wines have been great. So I'm really excited for, you know, whatever, whoever ends up with these wines for the whole experience and everything. So uh, thanks a ton for the time, Palmer. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll speak soon. Sounds great.